Like this is, mm-hmm. as we said, a show that requires your attention, but rewards your attention at the same time because the the more deeply you watch it and the more deeply you think about it, the better it becomes. This week on Nerd Legion, we are actually straying away from our core mission of bringing you sci-fi and fantasy film and TV coverage for the first time ever, Doa. And we're going into historical drama. And the reason why is because, first off, I wanted to watch this show. And second off, you asked us to do this. We had a lot of comments from you guys saying, are you guys going to do Shogun? Uh, and it is alternative history, historical drama, right? It's not real history. It is a fictional account of Japan in 1600. Uh, but it's still historical drama. So how do you feel about straying from our mandate, Doa? Um, I mean, you could make a very loose argument that it is fantasy in that it is not real events. It is, I mean, I guess it's like, it's based on a a, a real English captain that did, you know, land in Japan and become the first Englishman to contact the Japanese, I suppose. But like, you know, but I don't think a lot of the stuff you see in the show happened. And, you know, there wasn't a guy named like John Blackthorne, which is like the most... Try try being named John Blackthorn and then telling people you're not a pirate. Like, good luck with that. That's like one of the most piratey pirate names ever in the history of piracy, right? My name is John Blackthorn, and I would very much like to speak to you. So so good luck there. But like, uh, I, I you know I I think it works. I think it works okay. People were asking about it. I also wanted to watch it. Um, and so why not? You know, if we do this every once in a while, it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. Uh, because you could say that uh, the Barbie movie is more fantasy than this is, you know, um, or science fiction, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> so I don't want to, you know, I want to be careful. I want to be careful because it's a slippery slope, right? But uh, I, I think we can deviate uh, from the norm uh, for for this. And I see this, I see this as a continuation of our review of Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Because ah, we just yes, because of Anna Sawai. We can't escape. And uh, and also her her dad in that show as well, uh, Takahiro Hira, who uh, played uh, her father in uh, Monarchy Legacy of Monsters. So, you know, we as much as we try, we just can't <laughs> escape that show. So to a certain extent, this is a continuation of the review of that show by comparison, maybe. Yeah, yeah, definitely by comparison, because Anna Sawai, and it, this is not her fault. Uh, she played the most thoroughly unlikable unsympathetic lead role in monarch legacy of monsters written that way yeah written yeah. that way because she was basically written to be as annoying uh, as humanly possible and also hilarious while she watched her school bus full of kids get eaten by godzilla <laughs> that's some intense trauma to put on your main character right away but okay <laughs> it's and then it's, it was then pretty terrible lucky you know, I I was just disappointed because so far in the first four episodes of this, uh, Kurt Russell hasn't shown up yet. But we oh. still got some time. We got some time, you know. <laughs> uh, it turns out there are an equal number of monsters in this uh, show as Monarch <laughs> Legacy of Monsters, which. Yeah, had, you know, you're right. It was notably the monsters were notably absent uh, from that show. Yeah. You know, there was a little earthquake in the fourth episode and I was like, Kaiju? Like, oh, no, not in this one either. No, no, guess not. Uh, if you guys are interested, we did actually do an episode of Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Please do not watch that show, but do watch our show because it's very funny. Oh, yeah. while we talk about all of the ridiculous things and how trash and how nothing actually happens uh, in that show. It's, it's very way better boring. than the actual show. It's way better than the actual show. Trust me on that one. I'm, <laughs> I'm an authority on this. Um, same goes for our Rebel Moon episode. Don't watch Rebel Moon, but watch us talk about it. That and guess what? There. We yeah. do have in mid-april the second rebel moon gracing us with its presence doa are you excited for what do you think Zack snyder is going to steal from this time do you think he actually Um... steals from dune to like ride the dune (laughs) wave i ride the dune wave sounds like a some sort of euphemism i don't know what that would be but like uh I possibly I want to see um, I want to see some sandworms or the equivalent written here. I just I just linked you the poster. Have you seen the poster for Rebel Moon yet? We I suppose <laughs> we'll talk about this for a second. Here's a poster for Rebel Moon Part Two, the Scar Giver, uh, and it in itself looks quite generic. 
You've got. Uh, I mean, uh, I can tell you right now, Doa, that this poses. Yeah, it, it, the, and the name is accurate because I will be suffering emotional <laughs> and intellectual scars from having to watch this movie. You'll be scarred for scarred for life. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the emotional scar giver. Yeah, that's uh, that's fair enough. Uh, the what thing I'm worried about though is if you you see um, uh, on the the poster. Do you looking at? The poster yeah, I'm looking right at it. All right, so we've got Nemesis, right? Um, and uh, she's got her not lightsabers, and they're they're kind of dangerously close to what looks like some very dry uh, wheat. <laughs> and uh, I know from uh, growing up uh, in rural Minnesota for for a portion of time, like if you have dry crops and uh, any sort of heat source like that, you are looking at a pretty devastating wildfire. So um, <laughs> they're trying to protect this planet. Put the flaming hot. Cheeto laser swords away because you're about to start the whole crop on fire. <laughs> so already I got some problems. I'm just with this, with this movie. <laughs> no risk. Very yeah. inaccurate depiction of uh, of farming safety. Yeah. What a disaster this movie is going to be. I can't wait. <laughs> I me too. But anyway, back to Shogun. <laughs> yeah. So what did uh, you think about Shogun? Just I really enjoyed about. it. I, I really yeah. enjoyed I, I now neither of us have read the original book by James Clavell, uh, which I am I've been told many times is very good. It was written, in fact, almost 50 years ago, 49 years ago in uh, 1975. So it's wow. a relatively old book right now. And it is similarly to this show based on uh, on real history and primarily it is based off of a, a man called Tokugawa Ieyasu, uh, who became shogun in the early 1600s. Um, so he founded the Tokugawa shogunate in 1603, and basically that started the Edo period. Uh, Edo is Tokyo. It was the old name for Tokyo. And that lasted until the middle of the 19th century when the Meiji Restoration occurred, um, which is when kind of the imperial family took back control of Japan from the the shogun. And the shogun is a is a title uh of warlord that was basically the the primary military ruler of Japan. Um yeah. and so this was a feudal system. So becoming the absolute ruler or the shogun was very difficult because you were competing with other nobility and and warlords uh which were called daimyo. And so that's why we have in this, basically the, the thrust of this story is the old leader had died. And so now there is a council of regents. So there's five lords, daimyo, who are working together to rule as regents because the current son of the previous ruler is too young. So they're trying to administer the country until he becomes of age. But of course, Doa... Uh, they're not actually doing that. They are instead yeah. vying for control and eventually obviously going to somebody is going to kill this kid before he turns 16 as Naturally. one of the five seeks to consolidate power and become Shogun. So it's called Shogun because this is a show that is a 10 episode miniseries. So it will not go beyond one season. Uh, un Yay! because that's the that's the duration of the book. Unless though this does well enough, and then they'll just start writing more material afterwards. Obviously, Sh Shogun uh, obviously. Two, the next oh Shogun Two Rise of the Shogun <laughs> is uh, what we can expect from that one. Yeah, Shogun Two: The Meiji Restoration. Um, yeah, oh, several yeah. hundred years later. Uh, I, but you ever play the Shogun video game? Shogun uh, Total War, like the absolutely old, the original Total War. Yeah, I played Total every War. Total War game, and I started with the original Shogun. Yes, me too. I mean, we all start. That's where you know we started. But uh, it's the only one I've played. <laughs> I should, Shogun Two. I don't know why I haven't played way. anymore. I don't know why I haven't played anymore. But I, I always just went Ninja, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. that was a very easy path to victory. So, and they had but the I cool little game. assassination videos with the ninjas yeah. and the geishas. Those were great. You know what's sad, Doa? Part? This is this What's is such a sense? this is such a, a a tangent. They That's never okay. brought those assassination videos back in any of the right? subsequent Total War games, even Shogun Two. So it was very mm -hmm. disappointing because as a kid, that was one of my favorite parts was like watching the success or failures of my ninja and geisha at assassinating. Yeah, people. well, because those were great because when the video started, you didn't know if yeah. you were going to be successful or not, and the way the video played out showed you if your assassination assassination attempt 
worked or not. Right. And so it was there was this like sense of anticipation. It was so much fun. And that maybe I think that's the main reason I didn't play any of the other games. I just missed those too much. <laughs> like I can't watch the funny and they were a lot of them were kind of comical and stuff too. Like oh yeah. It was it was uh it was great. Yeah. But and it was also called Shogun, so <laughs> we had to talk about it. That's not a tangent. That's right in line with our episode. That's right. It's it, it's it's the gaming equivalent of this. So if you have played any of the Shogun uh Total War games, which you should, I, I hope they come out with Shogun three at some point. Uh that would be delightful yeah. because it's been a while since Shogun Two was released. And uh, it is really fun to play those games. But you're, you'll probably f be familiar if you have played with the um, kind of feudal system, uh, because all the all of the economics are done in Koku in that game, which is the definition of Koku, I believe, is a year's supply of rice for one person. So if you're getting paid, you know, X hundred or thousand of Koku, that basically means you're getting paid the equivalent amount of rice for that many people. Uh, for an entire year. So it is mentioned later when um, John Blackthorne has made Hatamoto that he has a salary of 240 koku, which means that, you know, that's a, it's quite a lot of money to get paid yeah, the equivalent lot. of 240 people's like rice rations for an entire year, plus getting his own house. Uh, so a lot of a lot of the things you might learn from playing the Shogun Total War games, because Obviously, Creative Assembly is known for really diving deep into history and trying to incorporate those kind of tactics and doing a lot of research themselves uh, does tie into this show. So go play Shogun if you're into yeah. this. Yeah, well, after after you watch this, don't turn this off yet or <laughs> listen to this. Don't uh, you go, do it at the same after. time, in fact. Yeah, you could. You know, that's the beauty of a podcast. You can you can multitask. <laughs> you can, you know, play a game and listen to uh, people talk about seemingly random things when they told you they were going to talk about one show. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So to get into the show, uh, this is actually made by Justin Marks, who is the writer of Top Gun Maverick. So seems a good movie. Uh, it seems like kind of a random, you know, association. Um, he also wrote oh. Street Fighter, The Legend of Chun-Li, Della. So he's Wait. a... <laughs> really? I never saw yes. that. Street <laughs> I saw, yeah, I mean, we all remember the Raul Julia as M. Bison Street Fighter from, from back in time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but I, the legend of Chun, I, I vaguely remember this coming from out. 2009. Oh, wow. It has a 3% on Rotten Tomatoes. Maybe someday oh, we could right. review this movie. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, uh. Yeah, I always, uh, well, here's something that I, I had thought about. I was talking to my little brother about this, where we wanted to do a review series, um, maybe, maybe three of us, where we just went back and only reviewed uh, fighting game films, because there are dozens of them. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. that is a year's worth of content, at least. So, uh, yeah, this is definitely uh, one of them. Wow, it's Michael Clark Duncan as Balrog. Wow. <laughs> I got I to gotta see this one now. All right. So, uh, you know. He also wrote the live adaptation, the live of the Jungle Book in Disney's ongoing series of attempting to make live action films. Did not um, see that. So it, it is kind of a weird, I would say it's it's an unlikely, um, you know, it's an unlikely creator of this series. Uh, but, uh, and it also, this is like we saw with Blue Eye Samurai, also written by Rachel Kondo, who is married to Justin Marks? <laughs> oh, so it's another connection there. <laughs> it's another husband-wife combination, like we saw with the creators of Blue Eye Samurai. Um, okay. Also, the wife being Japanese American. Uh, but this show, you know, takes itself very seriously. And just to to start off, you know, right away, what's impressive about this show is the production value because it has huge amounts of money going into the sets, the costumes, you know, making it look extremely realistic for the early 1600s. Yeah. And it does a very good job. And they also, I was reading up on this show, Doa, and they also did some very cool things, such as when they were writing the script, they would translate it into Japanese, then send the Japanese script to a playwright in Japan who specialized in language of this period, Japanese language of this period, who would then alter it to 
be accurate, historically accurate for Japan in the early 1600s. And then they would translate that back to English. That's so really it, they were really dedicated. That's why, you know, a lot of the Japanese words that you might know while watching this show, like arigato gozaimasu for thank you, are not in here because they use different words that were historically accurate for the period. <laughs> Um, one of the one of the things I always love in TV and film is is how they portray different languages being spoken for a specific audience. So obviously, this show I feel like was produced primarily for an English speaking audience. Um, but uh, yet you have multiple languages being represented here, and how do you do that in a way that's right. like, you know, comprehensible? So, for instance, you notice the Portuguese is just English, right? Yes. I mean, we, there uh, is no English in this show. To be clear, at no yeah, point exactly. in time are any characters speaking English. They are speaking Portuguese or Japanese um, exactly. or Dutch, actually. They're speaking because he's speaking Dutch so, to the crew. John Blackthorne is speaking Dutch to the crew, Portuguese mm -hmm. to the uh, to the priests, and to uh, Mariko, who's who's Anna Sawai's character, and then everyone else is obviously speaking Japanese to each other. So I thought that was really interesting, too, because they do a good job of explaining it like they don't overdo it, that this is not actually English being spoken. But uh, it it's a uh, it's interesting to see them just kind of take a couple languages and be like, OK, well, we don't want everything to be subtitled in this. We want, you know, right. it to be kind of a balance here. And, and so they have all the European languages essentially be English to our yes. ears. And then we see subtitles for Japanese uh, because that's the the main place where this is take you know the main you know area where this is taking place that makes sense this is happening in japan so we should be hearing the language of the land being spoken as is you know so i i like that uh i like that uh, representation of that because you always see different approaches to it you know where do they just subtitle everything do they have um a scene where like they're speaking different languages and then it like zooms in on the character's lips and then it becomes English. And then you, you know, you're supposed to understand that they're still speaking that language, but now it's just English. So you can understand it without having to read subtitles. You know, you have characters go through different sort of changes where they learn a language. And so then the language that was originally subtitled is now English because we're seeing it from the perspective of that character and they understand it now. So we do too. So I, I always think it's really interesting to see how different shows approach that topic. And uh, I thought they did this one uh, really well in terms of having a, a nice balance of listening and, and reading for the viewer. So that was cool. My name is Martin Albito of the Society of Jesus. You must be the engine. What does that mean? It means pilot. The way Tsuji means translator for me. You're in the court of Lord Yoshi Torinaga. And I am the interpreter to the Council of Regents. Oh, good. So you'll be able to twist my words in your Portuguese favor. Yeah, and they also cast a lot of actors who have been, who are fully bilingual or who have at least been in, um, you know, Western films and, and TV shows, such as uh, Hiroyuki Sanada, who is, plays Toranaga in this, uh, who actually is Scorpion in the new Mortal Kombat films, which is pretty I haven't funny. I have seen that yet. I, I seen that Doa, yet. look, I, I know, we talked about this the other day. Yeah. That is actually sad, Doa, because... The new yeah. Mortal Kombat film, I'm not going to say it's good because it is not a good <laughs> film, Okay, but it is exactly what Mortal Kombat should be and I think is very successful at being Mortal Kombat. I, I, I had a lot of fun watching that movie. So my question is, how is it more what Mortal Kombat should be than the 90s Mortal Kombat movie? Because that was very Mortal Kombat, I thought. In there, a way yeah, of course. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. It's just a more modern interpretation of that. But, like, it's a little darker and more violent, I would say. Some games are now, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it, it is still, I think, quite successful as, as you know, what it does. And uh, Sanada is actually, I mean, he's coming back for Mortal Kombat 2. Uh, <laughs> so. Great. <laughs> Okay. which uh, is in post-production right now. And I'm sure we're going to do on this show, Della. I'm sure we're going to do it on this show. Yeah, I I've always wanted to watch uh, that, uh, that the first Mortal Kombat or the first of the new Mortal Kombats. There's too many remakes. Um, but I, I, I will, I'm looking forward to watching that for the show. I will say that. Yeah. I had a ton of fun playing Mortal Kombat 1. And I'm not talking about, oh, I hate this. 
I'm not talking about the first Mortal Kombat game from the 90s. I'm talking about Mortal Kombat 1 that came out last year, um, <laughs> which was really fun. But, geez, I'm so tired of don't, don't get me started. It was a great game, but come on, you know? <laughs> All right. So, I'm Shogun, uh, for you guys out there, it is a political intrigue drama, yeah. right? We, we get into this show, and the main character is uh, Yoshi... Toranaga, who is supposed to be Tokugawa, the real the real historical figure that is his analog is Tokugawa. And this is about basically his machinations in order to become shogun. And he is he is one of the lords on the Council of Regents. As we get into the show, he is um, basically making political moves that are making the other Council of Regents unhappy uh, because he is kind of obviously angling for increasing power by increasing the size of his fief. Become and he has, yeah. yeah, he has a very good relationship with the child who will become uh king and his family. Um, and also is trying to take on additional wives. So he's securing political alliances by marrying additional women. So he does appear to be consolidating power. And the way that his primary rival, who is a man named Ishido, wants to combat this because he is also trying to consolidate power is to convince the other regents to kill, you know, to create a situation to execute Toranaga, which of course we all know Doa will then result in Ishido himself consolidating power as they take out his main rival. And presumably like, you know, Ishido will try and take over the fief of Toranaga. So Toranaga is a little bit too canny for this. He expertly manages an escape out of Osaka, which is the current capital um, and is Ishido's fief and um, kind of returns back to his home and starts to uh, raise an army. Now, where does our white Englishman come into this? Well, he is part, he is a navigator. He's a sailor. He's a navigator on a, a Dutch ship that is part of a privateer fleet. And this is actually important, um, posing as merchant vessels. So at this point in history, the Portuguese control trading rights with as they put it in this show, the Japans, which sounds like something uh, Donald Trump would say as he uh, <laughs> declares that there is going to be some sort of economic pressure. I've been um, to the Japans many times. <laughs> I love their Gundam model kits. <laughs> we'll reach the Japans. Japans, listen to yourself. That is the scurvy talking. We'll lay claim to that dark land. Then it's back to Holland. Rich, having gone round the world. Uh. So, uh, John Blackthorne is one of the last few uh, surviving people. There used to have like this little fleet of five ships that was going around and, you know, raiding Portuguese ports. Um, basically, this is a, a conflict because this is very soon after the Reformation. Um, so this would be basically this is the era to put this in historical context of Elizabeth the second. Yeah. It, so, you know. In the early 1500s, that's when uh, Martin Luther posted the theses. We're now in about 1600. This is the reign of Elizabeth II. Um, obviously, the Anglican Church had been created by Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII. Um, so they hadn't been Protestant for very long, like a couple generations. But this is definitely painted as a conflict between the Catholic Portuguese and Spanish and the Protestants of Northern Europe. And so... They are out basically looting, you know, Portuguese colonies, and they're trying to figure out where Japan is because everybody during this time period wanted and for hundreds of years afterwards uh, wanted act trading access to China and Japan, who are famously both very closed off. Um, you know, China allowed the Portuguese into Macau and the British into Hong Kong later. Um, we we had Japan who did for a time allow very limited trade, but especially Japan was very concerned about Christian influence. And what happened historically was after the Tokugawa shogunate began, they basically kicked all the missionaries out of Japan and closed it off even further. So the result of, you know, kind of John Blackthorne being here spoiler and helping. Uh, what? Spoiler alert. Oh, spoiler alert. Yes. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and helping Toronaga is that once, you know, Toronaga or Tokugawa, who's the real historical character, 
um, you know, consolidates power in Japan. He isolates the country further, and it kind of remains that way until the Meiji Restoration. Um, and if you guys want a historical drama of that period in time, you can go watch The Last Samurai. So, uh, you know, famously later on, uh, the, or the Admiral... anime Rurouni Kenshin. Oh, Rurouni Kenshin, which is uh, I think they remade recently. Actually, did they? I don't know. That, yeah, that's I think they made anime. a new. It is a great anime. Um, it's that during that time period too. Obviously, yeah. there's a bit of fantasy involved in that one too. But yeah, yeah. But The Last Samurai is is another good example of that. Yeah, yeah. The which also uh, our lead character, our lead actor Sanada was he was also in The Last Samurai. So he was he's been in a bunch was of this he stuff. Really? Yeah, Wait. he was. <laughs> Oh yeah, he was. He was like one of uh one of um Ken Watanabe's like uh um like not you know one one of his like dudes in his in his entourage. I don't know how to, I don't <laughs> one of know his the one of his term. mans. Uh but that was, you know, over 20 Yeah, that's right. I that was over that, yeah. 20 years ago now, but um I like that movie. Yeah, it, yeah, it's still a, it's still a fun movie. Um so yeah. anyway, this this just puts us square in the middle of like this is the, a time period when there is a big kind of push by Western nations to crack uh, China and Japan, both for control. So they want to convert them. Um, and especially they want to convert their leaders. And that is definitely part of the, especially the Catholics, because they want them to basically submit to the Pope so that they have control over the leadership of these nations uh, yeah. so that then they can, um, you know, extract resources and get valuable trade going, um, you know, with Japan. So uh, you can see a big part of the plot of this show is that they are very nervous about John Blackthorne being there because he is a Protestant. The Japanese don't know about Protestantism, don't know about the conflicts in Europe, and they're afraid that uh, he will reveal, you know, truths <laughs> that yeah. they that they don't necessarily uh, want to have known. Which is exactly what he wants to do, you know. I, I think first and yeah. foremost, it seems like he just wants to get out of there, but also he wants to, you know, keep with his mission, like you mentioned earlier, of messing things up for Portugal and the and the papists. So they don't know about us, do they? You've told them Portugal's the only flag in Europe, which means I am the first thing you say to reach your Catholic treasury, and you have no intention of translating my words. Yeah, he's, he's got that. Like, uh, and and can I say Cosmo Jarvis, who plays uh, who played Blackthorn, has an incredible voice, like a super super great voice, which I really like. But I feel like he's kind of channeling Captain Jack Sparrow the entire time too, because you notice he's always walking around a little bit. Like, if you're listening to this again, he's kind of he's kind of got that walk. He's like, oh, oh, that's I'm not <laughs> I'm not used to that. Oh my, that's quite improper. Oh, and, but he's always doing this thing with his hands and kind of stumbling a little bit. And I'm like, that's maybe a, just that's supposed a to be drunk the whole time. Choice, I, but like, where is he getting it? You know, sake. <laughs> that's another last samurai callback. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, like I, I feel like it's weird. It was it's weird watching him at least in the first four episodes because he does this kind of weird stumbling arm thing that I've only ever seen uh done uh he's by still, captain jack sparrow in the past he's still so. trying to get his land legs back <laughs> under him though he's guess. been he's been on a ship for like years at this point in time uh oh, so I, i'm on the moss oh i'm on the moss <laughs> i have to get back onto the rocks so <laughs> yeah christ sorry you should not walk on moss it is very disrespectful Yeah. Also, he looks exactly like Tom Hardy, which threw me quite a bit. <laughs> a little bit. Well, yeah, I, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we could do that. Uh, Shogun, uh, Fury Horse, I guess, because like they just ride horses at this point in history. I mean, he is pretty good. I, I mean, I like his character in this as yeah. as a crass. You know, he he definitely comes across as a working class sailor. Right. He's got the mouth sure. of a sailor. I'm impressed because Portuguese is not his native language that he knows that many <laughs> curse words and like that oh, many how can descriptive you, how can you insults in, you in Portuguese. Know, how can you say that when you know when you're in another country learning that language, the first thing everybody wants to teach you is swear words. Like, yeah, but it's not just swear Korea. words. He, he, yeah. he knows niche vocabulary to form creative insults. That's what a, blows me away. He's a connoisseur of the, of the uh, you know, a negative uh, verbiage. What, what can you say, you know? 
How fast can that bitch go, Rodriguez? You black-eyed son of a shit-fested whore! Your lips are on the devil's arse! They're on your mother's first! <laughs> Not even miss a son of a bitch. <laughs> Um, but yes, he is. He is. Earth. He lives up to the foul-mouthed sailor archetype. Um, I think what's fun about his character, though, Doa, is that he is a puppet in this series. He is definitely not the main character. Of course, he is, yeah. He is purely a lens through which you see the action from a different perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And they do the whole like, oh, he's a fish out of water thing. And obviously, part of his character arc is in fact learning. Um, that these people are not barbarians and in fact developing respect for their code of honor and their ethics, which he does basically immediately because essentially the first scene of this show, Doa, is him being on the ship. They are becalmed. Their ship is in tatters. Like they are just fucked drifting around on the ocean in the doldrums. And what does the captain of this ship do? But he's basically like, I'm just going to commit suicide to get myself out of this situation, even though... Blackthorn is like, no, we actually are close to an island. Like, I, I was taking soundings, and I found this white sand. Like, we just need to persevere and push forward. He's like, no, nah, I'm just going to kill myself instead, which, uh -huh. you know, kind of showed an absence of leadership, especially <laughs> when he definitely has the option to stay alive and keep pushing. And this is immediately contrasted with the fact that um, when he sees another person uh, in a potentially dangerous situation which is uh yabushige, yabushige. Yeah. yeah yabushige who is in the waves they're trying to save this spaniard navigator um and yabushige is in the waves now this is truly a situation where he is going to die and he is much more calm he takes out his sword and threatens to kill himself so it's a very similar situation except the difference is the captain kind of didn't do his duty. In fact, he shirked his duty to kill himself. Whereas this guy, he's a lord and he's literally risking his life to save somebody else. And when he is in a situation where he is definitely going to die from drowning, getting smashed on these rocks, that's when the sword comes out. And only in that moment when the, the rope comes down to save him, they get him in the nick of time before he drowns. Mm. But it's a pretty interesting contrast between the reaction of the Dutch captain and this Japanese lord um, to a situation where they perceive it's life or death, whether that's the reality or not, is a, is a different story. Yeah, it's an interesting little sort of like a subplot, subtext, substory, whatever you want to call it to this, where it's a, the, the idea of when do you die? Um, you know, in what situations should you die? Uh, in what situations, you know, will you die? Because you see a lot of it, right? Where you see some deaths when that is are suicide very honorable versus not, not honorable. And it's not even just suicide in this too, right? There's a situation where the uh, the father and the the baby are killed because of a you know a, an insult, right? There's and then there's a situation where the one guy is trying to talk to John too much, I think, or talk to somebody else too much, and uh, the Lord's kid just turns and cuts his head off, you know, out of nowhere, right? So it's like death is uh, is is definitely kind of always around, and the question is is like. When do you choose to face it on your terms versus, you know, when does it kind of come out of nowhere? And so it 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 uh, it makes you think, but it also puts a very like unsettling vibe on the entire show, which which I like that kind of goes throughout all of it where it's like you never really, you know, know who's safe. Right. Because it can happen to anyone at any time, whether it's by their hand or by something totally random or by something that they did to cause it, you know. So I think it's an interesting sort of emotional element that's that's inserted into this throughout. Right. And and it is shown very explicitly to be part of the kind of psyche of yeah. the Japanese yeah. at the era, because even uh, Mariko later on, when the earthquake happens at the end of episode four, she basically goes on a monologue saying, oh, yes, we have earthquakes. We have tsunamis. You know, um, death is always hanging in the air here. It is why our houses are built to go up as quickly as they come down. Because death is in our air, in sea, in earth. It can come for us at any moment. Uh, and it, it feel you know, she makes the connection that even nature itself is kind of holding the sword of Damocles over people's heads. And that is a great analogy for 
the court practices because everything is so subtle and so dangerous here because one outburst could require you to not only kill yourself, as you mentioned, Doa, but end your family's lineage in the in the killing of your infant child, like harsh, um, which is very harsh. Or, you know, you're playing a, a political game where you could just suddenly be assassinated for something that, you know, putting one foot wrong. I mean, there yeah. are the the very structured social customs of Japan in this era meant that any deviation was potentially a mortal sin which is pretty terrifying and certainly not something that uh, an Englishman would have been very under, it would not have really understood, right? Especially because yeah. of foreign customs, but also just because uh, it wasn't, you know, the West in that period was not quite as uh, suddenly brutal, I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also this interesting era of just like world history, right? Where when, you know, a, a ship from another nation like that arrived on your shores. It was basically like aliens landing, you know, um, for, for both sides, kind of, you know, for, for them, it was like visiting another planet, you know, for the people there, it was like aliens landing, because again, you had these people that looked very different from you. You had this technology that was very different from what it used to the, the art, you know, just the way the ships were built, the, everything was so different from everything you were used to in your sphere. Right. It was, it was different in a way that like, is difficult for us to understand nowadays where we have, you know, so much access to travel and information and, and, you know, in the U S especially like everybody is from everywhere. Right. Uh, so, so this era of history has always been really interesting to me because there was like a real otherworldliness to meeting people from other places that I just don't think exists very much anymore, you know? So that's, it's kind of neat to, to be fair, Joe. I still kind of situation. feel that way when I go to Japan, <laughs> I, you know, whenever I go to Japan, I'm like, this is very different. And, you know, both of us have but lived in Asia and I yeah. still feel that way when I go to Japan. I think it's, it's different though, because like you still, you kind of know what's coming though. There's always surprises, right? But you know about where you're going and you know, kind of what to expect and what you, what you see isn't like a total shock everywhere you look, right? Sure. There's going to be, there's always going to be surprises when you travel, but like, you know, if I go to Egypt, I know I'm, if I go to Cairo, I know I'm going to see the pyramids and that's not going to be some monumental shock to be like, what in the world are those sure. things, you know? So whereas, you know, back in this area of his era of history, you could go to a place and have no idea that oh, just yeah. around the bend were the pyramids or something, you know? Right. I mean, so. clearly, I think that's that's played up very well in the show when uh, Blackthorn goes to Osaka, right? Because that is yeah. a scale of city that is on par with the big cities of Europe, but entirely different to London, where he's from, Um you know, different yeah. the castle and everything like that. And he is pretty so clearly wowed by the experience. Yeah, so I just think that dynamic is always interesting when you see it uh, in a show or a film or something. I've always enjoyed that because it's kind of a kind of like a, a a what if brain exercise, you know, trying to imagine yourself in that in that situation. Because you know, even when I went to Korea, you know, in 2011, and uh, I didn't know anything about Korea when I went there except that they had really good StarCraft players, and there was a war at one point in the 50s. Like that's that's the only two <laughs> things I knew. You know, I I you know call it a failure sure. of the education system, or whatever. But we just didn't hear a lot about Korea beyond the Korean War, right? And then what I learned about it from StarCraft, you know, and and so there was a lot of new things to to experience uh, when I went over there the first time, and and uh, that was that was a ton of fun. I, I loved every second of it, uh, and I'm not exaggerating. So it's always neat to see uh, this era of history where everything was was big and new and and uh yeah exciting and scary and and you know it's it's cool yeah yeah and you know this is similar to blue eye samurai which we had talked about um previously so we've got a lot of yeah. media that's coming out kind of within this time period uh right now which is a very i think a very interesting like few hundred years in japanese history i mean feudal japan is super super interesting and what I love about this is, you know, this isn't an action show, and it also doesn't really hold your hand through what's yeah. going on. Like, you I start that. right in the middle of things. The dialogue is not written in a way, Doa, that is screenplay e. And by that, I mean it's like one character is like, oh, hello, character. This is this other character. And they, they do, like, a very deliberate job of yeah. introducing plot points. You basically are just thrust into the middle of political intrigue and the characters are having very natural conversations about you know what what could be going on. 
but they don't provide the initial context. That is left for us as the viewer to figure out people's relationships, motives. Um, and I really appreciate that because this show doesn't treat you like a dumbass. Like this show yeah. demands your attention and you must actually use brain power to figure out who people are, their relationships to each other, and all of the subtle scheming that is going on within this show. And that, to me, is is definitely part of the fun. For sure. I mean, turns out when you don't have to spend, you know, 25% of each episode in, with characters giving dialogue that is essentially just exposition, you can actually have a lot ah, more... Ah, yes, Avatar, The Last Airbender, there. I'm looking at you. Or, you know, any, uh, you know, a lot of the other, you know, popular, you know, stuff that, you know marvel star Wars, all that kind of stuff you know all the newer stuff you know monarch legacy monsters where it's like when this character talks about it they in fact if you've seen the movie big trouble in little china uh they almost make fun <laughs> of this where uh you know they do the exposition in a comical way where the reporter person is like this person you mean the person who's known as this who's known for this thing and this thing that happened <laughs> and you know it's not natural that a person would talk this way and the way the lines are delivered by i think it's I think it's Kim Cattrall in, in uh, that particular scene I'm thinking of. I don't remember the exact lines. It's it's kind of played for laughs, right? But nowadays we have so many shows that has that type of dialogue. Like, oh, Bob, you know, Bob, who was a ruler of this kingdom from this year to this year, known as Bob the Merciless. And uh, <laughs> now his son is coming and he has an army that's 20,000 strong and they have sorcerers. And did you hear about what the sorcerers can do? They can do this and this and this. And it's like, okay, we get it. And, you know, sure, now you know what's happening, but you've been led into this in the most boring way possible, right? right. Uh, so this show reveals these things slowly over time. It makes you unsure about the loyalties of the different characters. Uh, you know, it's 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 entertaining, right? I mean, this is, uh, it, you have to pay attention. You know, it's not a second screen show, which is what, you know, some shows are being called these days where it's like they're being uh made to watch on a second screen where you're not paying attention to them as much you have to pay attention to this show but you will be glad you did because it's fun to sort of like have these realizations as time goes on about character you know arcs and motivations and things like that so yeah i like it it, it is refreshing isn't it yeah um so you know it's a, it's a very intelligent show and they're they're also i think it really does reward thinking about it possible uh re-watching it too um, yeah, totally. because I'm sure there's a bunch of foreshadowing for things that are going to happen. There are very interesting characters. Um, the, the way that the action is presented, um, you really sense the danger from a lot of characters because, uh, particularly one of the more interesting, uh, characters is Yabushige, who is a Lord underneath Toranaga, who is conspiring both with Toranaga and Ishido. Uh, because he doesn't know who's going to come out on top. And if yeah. he sides with Toranaga and Toranaga loses, then he will be killed as a follower of Toranaga and his family will die and his fief will be replaced by somebody else. So he's trying to figure out, OK, well, I want to support Toranaga, but I also need to make this kind of under the ta table deal with Ishido in case he wins. Um, so he he's close to Toranaga, can potentially betray him and therefore stay alive. And you really yeah. get to see the stakes of this for everybody, which is like the loser will just be totally annihilated. Right. Their family line will be annihilated. Their followers will be annihilated. Um, so it, it is really the ultimate stakes and the subtlety at which everybody plays the political game is the real joy of this show. Yeah, I mean, right up, you know, right through the end of episode four, you know, where where the the cannons are unleashed, right, and then uh, Yubashige is like, "Oh no, don't don't do that," because now he's suddenly kind of forced, you know, to, yes. to one side, whether he likes yep. it or not. So. <laughs> but I mean, this is also the guy where it's like. You know, he's he's one of the characters where we sort of become a little bit more attached to throughout the show. But then he's also, remember, the same character that boiled one of John's crew members alive just so he could kind of like listen and and experience that in the first episode. So right. he's got a kind of weirdo sinister streak to him, too. So it's it's like there's no there's no characters. Uh, it, it's hard to root for any of the characters in this, but it's kind of meant to be that way. This isn't a show with like heroes and villains. This is just a show where you've got a lot of people with different perspectives and different motivations, and we're kind of watching how it all plays out, you know? 
Yes. Uh, and also, I mean, it just goes, goes to show how powerless uh, a lot of people are in this process. Like, basically, yeah. everybody is is a pawn in this game that is being played by the daimyo uh, for control uh, and ultimately ascension to the role of Shogun. And you see that, too, with Blackthorn, because even though he is given... You know, he's basically made a, a samurai and like a high ranking samurai and given the title of Hadamoto and house and a salary and everything like that, because he's supposed to train the troops uh, in Western tactics using the cannons and guns that were taken from his ship uh, that arrived on the shore of Japan, on the shores of yeah. Japan. Um, so he becomes an advisor to Toranaga, but ultimately he is just a high status prisoner uh, who is being forced to do these things under penalty of potential death. Uh, and his fate is then yoked to Toranaga's fate, where if Toranaga loses, he will be killed. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's not a great situation. And even though it might be a gilded cage that he's in, it is still a cage nonetheless. I do refuse. I refuse all of this. I came here under clear terms with Toranaga. Sorry. Now he's bloody vanished. And I'm bloody prisoner all over again. Just with better living quarters. Yeah, I mean, he knows that right away, too. So it's it's kind of like, how does he respond to that situation and everything? And of course, you got to have the romantic angle, which is probably, <laughs> it's, it's in my opinion, the worst part of the show. Because it's, it's okay. like, it's I, I feel like it's all just very obvious. Right to like, you know that uh, Mariko's husband's coming back. Like, of course he is. Because when he's supposed to die, quote unquote, it's like, oh, he's fighting the guys and they push him back between the two buildings. They don't show him die. And I'm like, oh, gee, I wonder why. The and I've never read the book. Keep this in mind. I wonder why this happens. Oh, because they can bring him back later. And then you've got this love triangle thing going on where they're both serving, uh, you know, the, the same person, but they're fighting over Mariko kind of. And what does she want? Because he didn't seem like the nicest guy, her husband you know, but she has duty, blah, 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 you know? So it's like the whole thing. I'm like, all right, well, we kind of know how this is all going to play out. So it's, uh, I, maybe I'm going to be wrong, but I, that the whole little romance side story is the most boring part of everything to me, because I feel like it's also obviously laid out, you know, maybe, maybe these predictions will be inaccurate, but it sure seems like they're setting it up for this kind of stuff. You but know. they had the sex in the, in the last episode, though. Of course, they have to have the sex. <laughs> Otherwise, you can't have as much of the drama when her husband, you know, miraculously returns, right? And like they're all running and like trying to get, uh, you know, Tarnaga away, and and uh, um, and then like her uh, and her husband's like, "I'll hold them off," and I'm like, "Of course you will, <laughs> of course you will," because that's you know that's how these these angles these romance angles go in these stories. Yeah, so no shock there, and then it's like. Oh, and he's gonna die, and now she's free to, you know, get with our get with our Englishman, right? Oh, but we're gonna take it one step farther, and we don't actually see her husband die. We're just supposed to assume he did, and that's so we can bring him back later and have it be, you know, even more drama. Ooh, so I I find that to be a little bit dull because it's it seems obvious, and again, I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. I don't think you are. <laughs> I don't think I am. They're definitely setting that this, up, aren't they? <laughs> we've seen the same kind of thing in many, many different, uh, you know, stories over the years. You know, it's not a, it's not a uh, unique plot device. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I agree that it is kind of the most tiresome part of this show. I still really enjoy this show, but you know, mostly I enjoy it for the historical angles and for you know the Toranaga storyline. Yeah. Uh, as well as the the European political angle. So I like the the idea of the Portuguese trying to like cover up um, you know, their secrets and uh, oh, Blackthorn cool, yeah. Blackthorn like busting in and going like, Hey guys, did you know about Macau, the military base that they built <laughs> in China? And they're like, Yeah, wait, the Portuguese are are trying to build up military power in this region and are secretly gun running. And, you know, the Portuguese angle where they've converted two of the members of the Council of Regents and like supplied um, their militaries with Western weapons, um, which is a very big threat because, uh, at, you know, as it stands at the start of the show, even though Blackthorn's ship delivers guns and cannons to Toronaga eventually, you know, the two main players, Ishido and Toronaga, do not have 
you know, access to a lot of these Western goods. So they are concerned about e some of the minor lords, even though they are lesser in power and status. Uh, the other daimyo are maybe not as powerful as those two. They they do have immense wealth and uh, war equipment that have been given to them by the Portuguese as a result yeah. of their conversion to Catholicism. So I love, you know, all of the little details of this period and the way that the the global politics are like playing out in miniature in Japan, weirdly, while they, you know, Blackthorn versus the Catholics and them like trying to fight over uh, who has influence over which Lord, I think is a is fucking great. Like, it's so fascinating to me. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's a that's the political maneuvering is the best part of show and the, the conversations that happen around all of that, the subtleties. It's, you know, I, I feel like. I'm pretty proud of us for uh, and me specifically for lasting this long into the episode without mentioning Game of Thrones. But but here we are. Um, it's the same reason everybody liked Game of Thrones, uh, the books or the show up until, you know, you know what happened. But, uh, you know, up it, until the, the political subtlety went away and it just became about yeah. uh, undead versus dragons I and like the shittiest storyline possible. Right, right. <laughs> Thankfully, there's no dragons in this. But, uh, you know, it's it's it was the, the dialogue and the political move, maneuvering and the subtleties and the things that aren't said that we, the viewer, recognize because we get to be the fly in the wall for all of these discussions that makes the show intriguing. And so it's it's nice to get that kind of vibe again um, from from a show. I feel like we haven't really gotten yeah. that uh, in the stuff I've watched, at least since Game of Thrones, the early season. So it's and what fun. I like about this being based on reality doa is that it rewards you for actually knowing the history of this period um yeah. because the more you know about like the the treaty of uh tordesillas which is the division of the world that happened in the in the late uh 15th century from pope alexander the sixth between um, Portugal and Spain after the discovery of the new world by Columbus, you know, it makes a lot of this make more sense. And so uh, with Game of Thrones, because we were dealing with a fantasy world, we could only understand what was explicitly told to us in the show, right? Yeah. Because we had to understand the history that was given to us in the show. And of course, people say, well, I had, you know, if you read the books, you understand so this relationship more deeply, but that's fine. You're still dealing with a, a very closed you know, a closed world that could only be described by the books and the TV show itself. Whereas this, mm -hmm. there's basically an infinite depth because it's based off of real history that you can study very, very, very deeply. There's many, many more books, resources on, you know, everything from the history of Portugal to the history of exploration to the history of Japan itself, right? Japanese-Chinese relations play into this. Like, I don't personally know what the trade was going on between China and Japan was at the time. I know they didn't like each other very much, but I don't know really well, the history of that. So this was, you know, this was basically right after uh, Japan and Korea fought a couple of major wars, if I recall yep. correctly, which China did support, uh, well, not maybe support isn't the right word, but provide uh, forces to uh, combat the Japanese alongside of uh, the Koreans right. at that point. Obviously, and the Korea... China relationship over the the last millennia is very complex as well, and that plays into it. But you know, this was right after you know right. that had happened. And the the implication too that's given in the show is that the forces at Macau are being bolstered by Ronin, who are uh, lordless samurai who have converted to Catholicism. So there's a bunch of Japanese samurai that are in Macau who also helped defeat Taiko, the former Japanese leader, in the war in Korea. Uh, so it's almost as if the Portuguese themselves are trying to erode uh, Japanese power and prevent colonialism into Korea, right? So they're they're playing a very deep political game in the entire region, and they're trying to cover this up, which is why they are so yeah. desperate to kill Blackthorn, because he is somebody who might actually, and he does, in fact, tell them the truth about the extent of Portuguese involvement in Asia, which is something yeah. they definitely, you know, do not want the Japanese to be aware of. Well, I, I thought one of my one of my favorite scenes was where uh, he draws the map of the world for Taranaga and explains it because it's like, yeah, he's explaining the dynamic between Portugal and Spain and all that. But he's also like 
drawing a map of the world for somebody who doesn't know what the world looks like, right. which is really cool to think about. Like having having someone show up and be like, this is the planet we're on and here's the rough layout of that planet. It's like, it's a huge moment really where it's like, oh my gosh, this is, this is, you know, such a much bigger thing than, you know, my immediate sphere, you know? So again, from that, that period of history where there's a lot of knowledge that is hidden just because of, of, you know, cultures being much more isolated from each other just because of technology, right? And travel and things like that. To have someone be able to just show up and draw, a, even if it's a rough map of the planet for you, is, is such a momentous occasion. It was neat to see that kind of thing happen, you know? Imagine being that person sitting there being like, this is what the, I didn't even know it was a sphere. You know, this is, <laughs> this is what our planet, this is what the thing I'm living on looks like. That's crazy, right? That'd be wild to like get that information for the first time, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really fun. I mean, I love this time period in, in world history. Uh, I really, you know, love the, this whole, basically from the discovery of the new world, uh, to the influence and the trading companies, um, that later, you know, went to Asia, uh, both from, you know, the, the East India, the British East India company and, um, you know, the the Dutch trading company as well. So it, it's a very fascinating period in history when we start to see the interaction with uh, various cultures around the planet from the Native American populations to the East Asian populations. Right. Um, and it's great. So for me, this really this show really hits a lot of notes that I find super interesting. And I yeah. think it, it doesn't pander to you, which I really appreciate. Like this is, mm -hmm. as we said, a show that requires your attention, but rewards your attention at the same time, because the, the more deeply you watch it and the more deeply you think about it, the better it becomes in many ways. And yeah, I mean, the, the romance plot, it, it exists because it has to exist. So uh, let's be honest, yeah, it has to I exist. Mean, we may not does, like it. Does it. Yes, it does. But does it? You know. So here's here's the thing. Like, it does. does it? Um, well, the answer to that is this was based off of a real person named William right. Adams, um, right. who was in the early 1600s in Japan and he did become a samurai and he did actually live out the remainder of his life within Japan. Um, and he mm -hmm. did advise Tokugawa. He was an advisor to Tokugawa, the real person. And he, he later like helped facilitate trade between the West and Japan. He did, I, I believe, actually, you know, take a Japanese wife and have kids in Japan as well. Um, and he was called Anjin, which means, I guess, navigator in Japanese. Um, and there are actually, I think, towns in Japan named Anjin after him today um, that have existed for hundreds of years. So, Interesting. yeah, his life is really quite fascinating. And so, you know, I guess I take less offense at that though when we actually it is based off of a person who did have sure. romantic it's, entanglements it's in Japan. That, it's not that I I have it's not that I'm opposed to romantic storylines. It's it's more that just everything it's just playing out in such an obvious and predictable way. You know, which which again if that's, you know, if that's the way it's written in the book, that's the way it is, you know, but I, I feel like that's part of the show that I've seen many times before yeah. in other shows, you know? So even, even right down to the last samurai, honestly, where it's like, <laughs> you know, the, he ends up with the, uh, the former wife of a, of a slain in this case, slain in quotes, samurai, you know? So it's, yeah, I, I feel like, uh, you know, and, and even outside of, of those two things, we've seen that same kind of plot, you know, play out many, many yeah. times before. So for that, it's, it's kind of, you know, I'm like, well, whatever. It's it's not it's not bad, but it's just kind of predictable, right? Whereas the rest of the show, I feel like I can't really predict if I haven't read the book, you know. Um, but I will say, uh, in a completely unrelated note, that that uh, I find natto disgusting, and I can't eat it. <laughs> and uh, I it's, and I I love I will natto try is gross, any, by the way. I will try any food you put in front of me. One of my favorite things to do when I travel is to eat absolutely everything, like anything. I don't care if it's like the scariest most disgusting looking thing like i will i will try it i will try it eat anything and most of the time i'll be able to like find some appreciation for it you know um but natto is one thing that i have tried multiple times and i just cannot stand it like and my my wife loves it 
she it's, she actually it ends up in our fridge sometimes. I'm like, no, but she likes it. So what can you it, do? It's OK with rice if you like mix it in to dilute well, some of the. Yeah, I mean, that's how you generally eat sliminess it. Sliminess right? of it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not so a great gross. food. I don't know. I can't I can't eat it. I can't eat it. There's there's like two foods. <clears throat> there's like two foods in the world that uh that i i just can't bring myself to eat unless i'm absolutely forced one is natto and the other is pundegi which i is, was gonna say pundegi uh, has to be the other one yeah it's it's silkworm pupa um <laughs> they which is a, a a side dish in korea sometimes especially kind of in, in coastal areas I've, it seems like um those are just like little little bags of rubber filled with sand is what it, the best description i i can i can sour you for that. sour yeah. sour as well yeah it's they're gross <laughs> and i've eaten it multiple times because i'm like okay maybe the first time it wasn't like the best representation of that so i'll, I'll give it a shot again but now nah, it's not not for me you know if you are if you're out there if you're a big pundegi fan out there Hey, more power to you. Um, somebody's <laughs> got to eat it, right? Somebody's got to keep the Pundegi company in business. I, I, but it not, seems not like, me. <laughs> you know, the, the cultural crossover has been very interesting in terms of food in these shows because I also found it hilarious in uh, Blue Eye Samurai when he's trying to, like, feed them cow milk. Um, oh, yeah. It, it, <laughs> um, and uh, the Japanese are disgusted by that. They're like, oh, why would you eat the milk of an animal like that's gross it's super you know? weird when you think about it yeah i mean <laughs> that's the thing that's that's another it's another fun part of this period of history worldwide where it's like yeah you get this great clash of food cultures too and like every every culture everywhere has things that look so insane to other cultures right food wise <laughs> so it's fun to it's fun to see all that yeah, and uh, especially because, as we now know, many people of East Asian descent are lactose intolerant from not eating these foods for, you know, huh. forever, basically. <laughs> you know, it wasn't part of their their historic diet, so... Meanwhile, um, people in Wisconsin are putting cheese heads on their head. Yeah. <laughs> you can't get any more opposite on the dairy front, I think. Exactly. You actually wear a wedge of cheese. Yeah. <laughs> it's foam, but still. Um, but yeah, th yeah. So what, what were your, did you dislike anything else about this show, Doa? Like, uh, I, I mean, just purely, purely visually, it's fucking stunning. Oh yeah. It's great. Yeah. And I mean, I, I love the, uh, the, um, this is going to sound strange when I say it, maybe, but I love the usage of violence in this show because mm. it's, it's never used to glorify the violence itself. It's always used to show how dangerous violence is if that makes sense in in that when it happens it's usually very sudden and very shocking and you're like oh my gosh that could happen to anyone at any time and it's i i think that's more accurate to real life right where i mean yeah usually when violence happens it's kind of out of nowhere you know there isn't some big setup there isn't some big standoff and then people ignite their lightsabers you know and go to it it's usually kind of like, you know, it's a car accident, right? Or if it's somebody sucker punching somebody else, it's usually out of nowhere and it's usually immediately devastating. So uh, that last scene in episode four where mm. uh, the child of Toranaga um, unleashes the cannons from the other side of the valley on, uh, um, Ish oh, why am I forgetting the name now? But um, uh, Ishido's, you know I mean? Ishido's, Ishido's uh, yeah. messenger. Uh, yeah. uh, Right. And just seeing like the chain shot, just like, you know, tear through these people. And it's not like big explosion. Oh, now everyone's on the ground. It's like it is grotesque and, and awful and, and probably a lot like it really was, you know, and shocking. Right. Imagine seeing that kind of thing happen at the same time where all you, where you're used to like clean cuts, you know, and, uh, you know, very fine swordsmanship to just see people torn to pieces you know that that had to, that's another thing where it's like if you were in that time period and you saw that you'd be like what in the world is going on you know these weapons seem so crazy and terrifying you know and now now this is kind of unleashed on everybody right because the war is sort of unofficially kicked off at the end of episode four and so it been it seems that much more horrifying seeing up close what's going to happen to people you know so, yeah, and, and because there cool. hasn't been that much violence, or the violence has been relatively clean, just like a one cut decapitation. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. You know, seeing the seeing the real devastation of the, like Western weapons uh, mm -hmm. on the horses, and everybody the samurai all lying around disemboweled, uh, still alive, is like very shocking uh, and very yeah. well done. I mean, it's very it feels very realistic, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, it, it's it's a fun 
it's a fun way to to end this episode because as of this recording, we've only had the four episodes released. There are six more that are coming, and you know we may return to it later on this show to kind of wrap up our thoughts on this series because it is quite good. But I would say if you get into this, give it a couple episodes because the first episode is it it takes a while to. It seems like we said because you you kind of are thrust into the middle of the action that. You don't really understand what's going on, particularly amongst the daimyo. Um, and so it takes a little bit of time for you to figure out exactly who everybody is and the relationships that are going on. But once you do that, I think the show becomes significantly more interesting. But it is, I will say, a challenge to kind of slide into it first, particularly in episode number one. I feel like that's a, that's kind of a creative choice, too, uh, by the showrunners, because, you know, John Blackthorne is is kind of the avatar of the viewer in a sense mm -hmm. that you know he's totally bewildered by everything that's happening around him and and so are we you know because we're kind of jumping into the middle of this as viewers you know so I I agree that the first episode was kind of hard to watch but now that I go back and think about it I'm like that's that's kind of appropriate because you know we are kind of feeling what what he's feeling where we just you know things are happening and it's scary and we don't really know what's going on but as we spend a bit more time there, um, as he spends a bit more time there, we start to understand the conflict and understand the players and things. And and then, you know, he starts to kind of participate himself by the end of the fourth episode, right? So I I kind of like that sort of, uh, you know, chain of events as a viewer too, sort of feeling that confusion and then uh, having the, the clouds sort of lifted over time, you know, as that character has it lifted for them too. So I, I think... Uh, I think it does make it hard to jump into the series, but I do think it's a good, it's a, it's a cool creative choice if it, if it was that, you know? Yeah. Overall though, the show is very good. Um, yeah, totally. the show is yeah. extremely good. Um, qu minor quibbles aside about what I would consider just for entertainment value, like a necessary romance subplot. Um, I, mm. I, I think, you know, they just feel it has to have this element to, you know, hook more people into it who may not be interested in purely political theater. Um, I, I, it, I think it could do without it, but <laughs> I understand why it's, no, I understand why it's there. I understand yeah. why it's there. Totally. Totally. I mean, yeah, it's, it's obvious, but uh, you know, it doesn't take away from things too much at least, you know? No, it, it doesn't take up much screen time. Um, and it isn't super badly done, I would say. Like, I do find the the relationship between Mariko and uh, Blackthorn to be interesting, uh, especially because she herself is an interesting character who learned Portuguese. Um, and so she she provides the bridge between the cultures. So most of the stuff where they're in a scene together is her doing translations or providing information that we, the viewer, also need on feudal Japanese culture uh, to Blackthorn. Um, yeah. So I don't find it because all of these scenes serve more than one function. It's not just like we have scenes that are purely for the romance angle. It actually conveys a lot of information to the viewer about what is going on. So that's why I just I, I don't mind it quite yeah. as much. Yeah, like I said, I I only do, dislike the predictable aspects of it. That's that's all. <laughs> um, and her, I don't like like her husband is coming back would be terrible, and like that's where I w He's might start to get pissed off. Absolutely coming back. He is absolutely <laughs> coming back. I I will okay. be I will be shocked. Yeah, he's he's coming back. They otherwise they would have shown him die. Like why? The only reason to not show him die is so that he can come back later. You know. Yeah. I feel like can't so, argue with that or, one. It's that's how it always stories, works, isn't it? Stories of the era in which this was written too, um, you know, had this as a plot point fairly commonly. So <laughs> I'm just saying, get ready for the return, uh, and then the inevitable uh, love triangle conflict that will take up screen time that we'd rather be watching other things. But you know, it, it is what it is. But uh, I, I think overall, the the show is gonna you know continue to be very good and and uh, and end well. I'm looking forward to watching the next six episodes. Yes. And uh, that'll wrap us up for today, guys. Uh, next week, we'll be doing the new Netflix show, The Three Body Problem. Uh, it'll actually be in a couple weeks. But yeah, the next I'm, I'm going to be road tripping from uh, from Minnesota to California to complete my my move. So I'm, I'll be a, I'll be a bit busy. Sorry, everybody. That's my fault. <laughs> it's OK. We'll be back uh, next episode in a couple weeks with Three Body Problem. See you then.